You can take Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if we can. Uh, Are we ready at the back I'm there? <laughs> um, we're actually streaming this live. So wherever you are sitting on in the audience, that's where you'll appear in the, in the, in the YouTube screen. Um, good evening. I'm Ben Dorman. I'm the chair of the Friends of the DAO. Um, we run this uh, center with the grace of the National Research Council. Um, we're nearly not but not quite all volunteer organization nearly all the people you will count at night are volunteers all except calvin back there and amy calvin is waving um he needs precise and very technical training to make sure that all this streaming stuff works beyond most of us um we have a treat this evening um dr james de francesco who is the director of the observatory is going to talk us talk to us all about Gerhard Herzberg, about whom, oh, after whom the Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics in the Canadian Natural Research Council is named. He won the Nobel Prize about 50 years ago. I think it's about 52 now, and this is delayed from, right? It was 71. Yeah, so, right, something yeah. like that. So this is held over from, um, held over from uh, uh, COVID. Um, we, the Canadian History Museum has produced a beautiful exhibition um, in collaboration with the German embassy. Uh, Gerhard Petzberg was a refugee from the Nazis and came to Canada um, during the war and uh, did his work on molecular spectroscopy. Did I just lean on something I shouldn't have done? No. All right. Yes. Oh, damn. <laughs> so you're getting a sneak preview. Yes, you're, you're showing all my slides. Uh, yeah, go back. They're not going to be secret for longer, right? Yes. Okay, so <laughs> thank you, James. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> what happens when you put your elbow in the wrong place? Everyone does that from time to time, right? <laughs> okay, James uh, is originally from southern Inter in Ontario. He got his PhD in astronomy at the University of Texas in 97. Uh, looking at the uh, second stellar disks around young stellar objects. Um, he then spent three years at Harvard and some time at Berkeley, all, all, of, all of the lousy places, you know, and um, joined the millimeter, sub, uh, millime millimeter wave group here at the, uh, in Victoria at the NRC in 2002. He's been the director since 2018. Uh, final word before I get James to take over, please uh, peruse the exhibition afterwards. There's a lot of great information about the impact of Hertzberg's work on, on Canadian science um, and all the, all, all the profound implications of, of molecular spectroscopy, which is not exactly very well known to the general public. So without further ado, thank you, James. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday evening with us. Uh, as the director of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, it's my pleasure to welcome you. And uh, I'm uh, very happy to see such a great turnout tonight. So in this short presentation, I'm going to be uh, summarizing the life and work and career of Gerhard Hertzberg, which has been introduced, uh, is a bit of a science icon. And as he mentioned, this um, exhibit right outside this auditorium was, uh, was sent to us as part of a traveling exhibit that's going around Canada to celebrate the 50th anniversary of him winning uh, the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Now, I'm gonna be talking a bit about, his, uh, about the significance of his work, uh, as well as the impact that he uh, has had on Canadian science uh, over, over the years. If anyone has any questions though, by all means, please uh, ask me. I'm happy to, to answer them during the, uh, the, the presentation. So first, uh, just to start, I would like to, uh, to answer the question briefly, who was Gerhard Hertzberg? There's a, a picture of him right there. Uh, well, he was an extremely accomplished uh, spectroscopist and physical chemist. Um, 
and uh, he worked at the National Research Council, which is the parent organization of the, of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory for uh, almost 50 years, uh, between 1948 and 1995. And uh, as we have said before, he was the winner of the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry back in, in 1971. As a result of winning uh, the Nobel Prize, he was a, a staunch advocate for science uh, in Canada. And he is the namesake of the research center for which uh, I work, the, the Hertzberg, uh, well, once the Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics, now the Hertzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Center. So I'm gonna be talking relatively briefly tonight, but if I uh, manage to stir your interest about Hertzberg, I really recommend that you check out uh, the website that the, the, the um, group known as the Defining Moments Canada produced uh, in recognition of, his, uh, of the 50th anniversary of his achievement. All you need to do is Google Hertzberg 50 and you'll, you'll find it. It's a, an excellent website with a lot of uh, very nicely written resources uh, about his life and work. But in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking mostly about five things over the next 20 minutes or so. Basically, I'm going to give a very brief review about uh, atoms, molecules, and spectroscopy, so you can understand what uh, the context of which uh, his work was, uh, was done. Then I'll give a brief biological sketch of his life, and then uh, I'll describe the three impacts, basically his impacts on Canadian astrophysics, uh, the molecular universe, and, and science in general in Canada. So to begin, many of us are, have a, a conceptual picture of the atom, very much like this picture on the left, where you have a nucleus made up of marbles, which consists of protons and neutrons, and they seem to be orbited by these other particles called um, electrons. This very common picture, though, is, is, a, is a bit of an, um, uh, it's, it's not quite what really happens in the atom. It's a very simplistic uh, uh, picture. What really happens um, is that the atom is a much stranger place than this, um, in that the protons and the neutrons and, and the electrons are actually fuzzier things than, than this picture would suggest. And, and even though the nucleus is still extremely small compared to the, the size of the, of the atom, um, the electrons themselves are spread over really what you could call a quantum cloud of, uh, where, where it could exist pretty much anywhere in this shell, if you will, but um, because of the nature of quantum mechanics, it's hard to know exactly where that is. It's a very, things get very, very weird when you get down to the sizes of like sub, sub nanometers, like uh, that scale bar shows there. But it's important to understand that, that it's because of this nature, this is why we have things like molecules and, and so forth in, within nature. Now, the periodic table is a very commonly seen uh, description of all of the elements um, in the universe. And it has this very peculiar arrangement for a very important reason. If you go from left to right and uh, uh, up to down, you basically are going to increasing sizes or masses of, of elements. Hydrogen is the lightest element with one proton and one electron. Helium has two protons and two electrons. Um, helium also has two neutrons. But as you go uh, down the chart, you're just getting nuclei uh, of increasing numbers of protons. But the rows in the famous periodic table are because of how the electrons are arranged around the nucleus of the atom. Basically, now, the, the electrons in that really fuzzy clouded uh, uh, arrangement are uh, arranged in shells. And they only can have so many electrons in, an, in, a, in a given shell before they have to be put into a different shell. So hydrogen and helium, their electrons are in the first shell. So that's why they have um, these different, they're, they're shown in this way, because on this side, uh, the shell is only partially complete. And then on the far right, the shell is completely full. So as you go work your way down the periodic table, you're basically going from one 
unfilled shell to a filled shell to the next unfilled shell to a filled shell and so forth. So it's important to understand that because the way chemistry works as well as the creation of molecules is that really the basics of chemistry are that electrons are shared between nuclei in adjacent atoms. And this is what creates the bonds that hold molecules together. And this is um, illustrated in this figure here, which is a, a very common molecule, water. Water has two hydrogens and an oxygen. And you can see that here the hydrogen atom has a nucleus and one electron, and the oxygen atom has a nucleus and six, uh, or sorry, eight electrons, two of which are in an inner shell and six of which are in an outer shell. Now, as a result of a chemical reaction, you can create the water molecule by having the electron uh, of the hydrogen atom and the oxygen atom shared between the two. And so that creates uh, an arrangement, a configuration that's very stable. And that's how we are able to have things like, like water. So a further illustration can be given by this uh, very dear molecule to me, known as 137-trimethylaxithine, which has a street name called caffeine. And you can see here that the atoms in the caffeine molecule have different bonds according to the different electrons that are available to make bonds with its neighbors. Carbon, for example, has four electrons in a, in a half-filled shell. And so it can make four bonds. Nitrogen can make three, oxygen can make two, and so forth. So this is the basics by which atoms and molecules combine to, uh, um, in, in, in ways uh, in nature. So the interesting thing about atoms and molecules is that they're so small that we can't look through a microscope and be able to see exactly how they are arranged we have to surmise this very carefully. And the tool that we use to do this is called spectroscopy. Now, because of the quantum nature of atoms and molecules on that scale, the energies of them, of the electrons around them, are very quantized. They, they can only exist in certain states. Unlike, say, things that are macroscopic like you and me, we can go at different energies depending on what we, what we want atoms and molecules are stuck in like just certain discrete states. Now, to transition between these states, when that occurs, um, you, uh, it can happen when um, uh, the atom or molecule is able to absorb or emit a packet of energy that we call light, which is really electromagnetic radiation. And the specific energy of that light is equal to the transition between those levels. And so by measuring the energy of that light or equivalently the wavelength of that light, we can then directly probe atomic or molecular structure. And we do this by splitting the, the light that we see from anything into its component colors. And then by looking at it very carefully, we can see the fingerprints of the elements in those colors. And we can do this through uh, a telescope, but, and we can see how things are um, done in nature. We can have a very controlled experiment and do it in a laboratory. Here is an illustration where the top would be uh, a spectrum, which is what we call the light spread out to its component colors of an unknown gas. And here are the fingerprints of five different elements. And you can see that helium and oxygen and neon and argon have a sequence of features and colors where certain wavelengths of light have been absorbed. And we don't see a match between any of these wavelengths and the wavelengths of the unknown gas. It's when we get to xenon, we see a perfect match between the expected uh, the absorptions and uh, that we expect from uh, an element and the unknown gas. So we can identify this as xenon. 
Um, and so by measuring these wavelengths, we get to understand what it is about xenon as an element that um, has to have an energy transition at a specific wavelength, which is wholly dependent on the structure within the atom. And it's also this true for molecules as well. It was in this environment that Hertzberg himself learned uh, about, the, about nature as a young man. So transitioning now to Hertzberg's biographical sketch, here's a picture of him as a young man. He was born in Hamburg on Christmas day in 1904. And he entered, he was a very precocious uh, child in a family of only modest means, but uh, he was showed a great aptitude for, um, for science and math at a young age and was encouraged to pursue this. He was actually very much interested in becoming an astronomer, but uh, famously was counseled against doing that because uh, someone told him there was no money in it. But uh, so with that in mind, he decided to go into um, more standard physics instead, but that did him very well. He entered the, the Technical University uh, in Darmstadt, and he earned his doctorate in engineering and physics in 1928, which is when this picture, by the way, was taken. He had postdoctoral stints at two places, the University of Göttingen with uh, Max Born and James Frank and the University of Bristol in the UK. And it's important to help to understand that at this time, there was a great flourish of scientific thought about the nature of matter. Uh, and this is when the, the whole of quantum mechanics was born in Europe in the early 20th century. And it was in this milieu that Hertzberg was able to learn and contribute to that incredibly explosive understanding of how the universe works on very, very small scales. When he was a postdoc, he met a woman named Louise Hedwig Ottinger, and they got married right at the end of 1929. And he went back to Darmstadt, and he worked as something called a privat dozen, which meant that he was able to participate in experimentation, though he wasn't paid for it, he just did it. And the only way that he was able to support, support himself and his wife was by giving lectures uh, to students at the time. Now, uh, he left Nazi Germany in 1934. Uh, at that time, it was extremely scary. Lots of academics were fleeing as a result of the, the, the Nazis' policies. And in particular, uh, Louise, who, by the way, was an accomplished scientist of her own, she was, in fact, the last woman to earn a doctorate in science um, and the last Jewish person to earn a doctorate in science um, in Nazi Germany. But the Nazis instituted a policy where not only could Jewish people not teach at universities, but people married to Jewish people couldn't teach at universities. And so he had to leave. And it was quite harrowing, but he was actually able to find a post here in Canada, in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan, a man named John Spinks, who had visited Hertzberg in a couple of years earlier, had told him, had made his acquaintance, and through uh, an international program, was able to bring him to North America. And uh, he was in Saskatoon for about 10 years, and he had an extremely productive time building up a spectroscopy lab there, where he was probing the nature of molecules at that time. Uh, after 10 years, he was lured away to Yerkes Observatory in, in Wisconsin because he was excited about the possibility of collaborating with astronomers and understanding uh, the through spectrum, spectra, what they were seeing. Uh, but it wasn't, even though he had a good time there, it wasn't to last, and he was lured back to Canada by people at uh, the National Research Council and he moved there in 1948. When he was there, he quickly became the director of the Division of Pure Physics at NRC and set up the world famous uh, or world class molecular spectroscopy laboratory where he spent decades investigating the electronic structure and geometry 
of molecules using many uh, spectroscopic um, experiments. And by developing this facility, he trained a large coterie of postdoctoral fellows and scientists who then went out and filled Canadian universities with their expertise, becoming professors across Canada. Around 1969, he uh, turned 65, and, uh, but he was working still and he did not want to retire. So the solution was that he became NRC's first distinguished research scientist, and this allowed him to, to continue working. And indeed he worked um, all the way until he was 90 years old. Over this time in this illustrious career, he, he was literally wrote the book about spectroscopy. This was the first of it called Atomic Spectra and Atomic Structure, and it's still available today. And it is an incredibly clear and concisely written uh, treatise about the nature of matter uh, on small scales and is a, a standard textbook, the Bible, if you will, for young spectroscopists. And he wrote a sequence of six books that many of which are still in print today over the course of his career. The first one was about atoms. He wrote four about molecular spectra and molecular structure, which I've abbreviated as MSMS up here. These books sold thousands, if not tens of thousands of copies. And as I said, uh, you can still buy them today. Even looking at Amazon, you can see the great reviews this book uh, still gets. So what were some of his notable scientific contributions? Well, in 1941, he was the, he identified the existence of a molecule called CH plus, which is just carbon and hy uh, hydrogen stuck together in a single bond, but in the interstellar medium. Now, at the time, people felt that the environment of space was too harsh for molecules to survive. Molecules, even though those bonds can be strong, are still can be relatively fragile in environments that are, say, too hot or there's a lot of radiation around. But amazingly, molecules were found to exist not also in, in space. In 1948, he proved that hydrogen molecules were present in the atmospheres of planets. Many people didn't know that planets, uh, what were plant, planets made of. And so planets like Jupiter and uh, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus have tremendous amounts of hydrogen in their atmosphere. And uh, 1959, he detected the ultraviolet spectrum of a particular uh, molecule known as methylene, which is a type of mo a molecule known as a free radical. Now, free radicals are highly volatile molecules. They have unpaired electrons in their outer shells. And so that means that they react extremely quickly with other molecules. In fact, uh, uh, CH2 or methylene was suspected to exist and seemed to be needed for many chemical reactions to work, but it had never been seen before because it is so short-lived that if it's out in the open, it gets gobbled up by other molecules really quickly. So he came up with an experiment that well, enabled him to, to verify its existence uh, for the very first time. When this occurred, his, uh, his coworker, a man named Jack Shoesmith, burst into the room and told him, and his reaction was, oh boy, oh boy. And they raced down to the lab to verify it. It was a very exciting moment in his career. And in fact, it was this um, discovery that really nailed him obtaining the Nobel Prize. It was awarded in 1971 for his contributions to the knowledge of electronic structure and the geometry of molecules, particularly those free radicals. And here he is meeting the King of Sweden on December 10th, 1971. He was actually introduced at that time as the world's foremost spectroscopist and whose work has influenced almost all branches of chemistry. Because what he did is he participated in laying down the foundations by which we understand chemistry today. This enabled him to have a tremendous legacy in Canada. Winning a Nobel Prize is a big deal. It's recognition on the world stage that you are of a, of, of a certain elite uh, in, in the world of science or literature or um, medicine or economics. 
And uh, here he is amongst the other Nobel laureates from 1971. Uh, on the left is actually uh, uh, the poet, Chilean poet, Pablo Neruda, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature that, that same year. And maybe it was because Canada was, uh, was, was finally feeling like it was becoming a mature nation that after the 1967 centennial, people were, were beginning to feel Canada had come of age, but him winning the Nobel Prize was a really big deal. And this meant, I think, that Canada was itself a nation that produced uh, the top level science uh, and stood shoulder uh, to shoulder with other nations uh, in science. As a result of this, many he, he received many accolades within Canada, not the least of which was that NSERC, which is a government um, funder of university research, uh, came up with the Hertzberg Canada Gold Medal for excellence in a career of science and en or engineering research, which awards up to uh, a grant of $1 million over uh, five years time. In addition, the Canadian Association of Physicists, or CAP, has their own Hertzberg Medal, which recognizes uh, the work done by a promising young physicist within about 10 years of getting their, their dissertation, or their finishing their dissertation and getting their PhD. On a more personal level, uh, the Hertzberg had his name uh, given to the uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, Research Center that NRC created in 1975. Again, it was called the Hertzberg Institute uh, of Astrophysics at the time. It only recently had its name changed. But nevertheless, we, we still have the name Hertzberg associated with that. And that was because uh, of his interest in astronomy and his relevance in astronomy, uh, his name uh, uh, attached to the research center gave it a certain uh, um, gravity uh, and uh, um, uh, reputation. Now, this research center, or I should say my research center, is actually important in the sense that what we do is that we provide access to the sky to Canadians. We have, uh, we manage and um, uh, support the observatories that Canada has access to. And that includes the, the telescope here on this hill right now, the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, as well as our sister campus located in the Okanagan Valley known as the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. But there actually is an act in parliament, the National Research Council Act, which actually says that NRC is responsible to operate and administer any astronomical observatories established or maintained by the government of Canada. And since all of astronomy in Canada was put under the um, uh, purview of the Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics back in the 70s. We have continued to provide access to um, other research facilities, including the 3.6 meter Canada France Hawaii telescope, which is located on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. That opened in the late 70s, I think 1979 the uh, eight meter Gemini North and South telescopes, which, which one is right next to the Canada France Hawaii telescope on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, when its twin is located in Northern Chile. And more recent, and we, that began around 2001, 2002. And then about 2012 or so, uh, the, uh, the 66 element uh, Atacama large millimeter array began operations in Northern Chile itself. So Canada has access to these top level um, international observatories because of the Hertzberg uh, Institute. And uh, that is uh, something we take uh, great, feel great responsibility for. And I think actually contributes to Canada being a world leader in astronomy, actually. So moving on to the, another facet of Hertzberg's legacy uh, is the recognition that uh, our universe is filled with molecules. I had mentioned that there had been, Herzberg was instrumental to the, looking to see that molecules existed in interstellar space. But around the time that he won the Nobel Prize, there was uh, the development of high frequency radio uh, telescopes 
that we're able to actually see the uh, emission from these molecules themselves. And what's shown here is actually a map of our Milky Way galaxy and the emission from the carbon monoxide molecule, which is a tracer of molecular gas throughout our, our galaxy and others. And you can see that this is a 360 degree view, and this points towards the center of our galaxy. And you can see how that gas is compressed into a thin disk of material along with the other stars and so forth. Then in the outer galaxy, things get a little bit rougher um, that, and it, it, we see a lot of gas both above and below the plane of the galaxy. We move in a little bit closer to say that piece over there. This is actually a, a zoom in of, a, of, a, uh, of an association of molecular clouds uh, known as the Orion Monoceros a molecular cloud complex. And that's because the constellation of Orion is located kind of in this direction here. In fact, the belt of Orion goes kind of along this um, line there. If you were to look at the constellation of Orion in the night sky with eyes that could see at the frequency or the wavelength um, that this uh, molecule is emitting, you would see the glow of gas from the, the molecules all along the left-hand side of the constellation. Now, this is an important thing because it's, these are the, the cold and dark environments that create new stars in our galaxy. And if you zoom in even further, say that patch there, and you looked at it with um, another telescope, you can see the great amounts of structure in these clouds. And you can see there are parts that are particularly bright because they are particularly warm or dense. And this is actually the famous Orion Nebula which um, uh, you can see is a very faint red blotch underneath the belt of Orion on a winter night. If you look at that more closely and you look at the stars, you can see that it is in fact a cradle where new stars are themselves emerging from the cocoons from which they, they have formed out of these vast amounts of, of, of molecular gas in the galaxy. In addition, we're able to see molecules in the environments that planets themselves are forming. Now, this is a recent collection of uh, observations from that telescope known as ALMA that I had described before. And you can see that each one shows a disk of material surrounding a young star. And these are some of the most advanced observations we have of the environments of which planets themselves are forming around young stars. And we know this because those, those gaps that we see are quite likely due to young planets that are excavating um, grooves in, the, uh, in these disks through their own gravity. And so this is the environment by which planets are forming. And by looking at these disks with um, ALMA uh, in the emission of the molecules, we can see how the molecules are arranged in these, um, in these disks and providing the, the raw material from which these planets are themselves forming, basically giving us insight into what the composition of these planets will eventually be. In fact, this, um, these observations in the, the middle of the, of the top row there, last week, there was an announcement that uh, the scientists involved in this program feel they had found a disk around a planet. Uh, in that a forming planet uh, around that, that star. So not only are we seeing a disk around the star, we are seeing now the disk around a forming planet as well. And that, so I would be remiss without telling you about the wonders of the James Webb Space Telescope uh, at, this, uh, at this moment. And it, even it is observing molecules in space among the very first data that were uh, provided was, was this incredible spectrum of a planet uh, seen with the James Webb Space Telescope. What's happened here is that an actual planet is uh, revolving around a star and every now and then it passes in front of the star. And when it does that, the light from the star shines through its atmosphere and then the molecules in that atmosphere absorb some of that light. 
leaving those fingerprints of their existence there. And what's shown here is the, is the, hub, is the James Webb Space Telescope telling us that that planet actually has water in its atmosphere. Uh, basically, because this um, planet is so close to the star, the, the, the planet is uh, warm. So what we're actually seeing here is steam in the atmosphere of this, uh, of this planet. So we're, we seem to be creeping closer and closer to understanding through uh, looking at molecules, what happens to the rise of maybe life in the universe. And even in that regard, uh, we're getting closer and closer. Now, life is itself based on molecules and our ability to detect life will very much likely be involved in our ability to detect molecules associated with it. And now this observation is from Alma showing the first detection of maybe the, the largest peptide-like molecule in space, a molecule with the curious name uh, uh, priopionamide. <laughs> and you can see the component uh, atoms there on the, on the right. Now peptides are themselves a very special molecule because they are the links between uh, 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 amino acids within proteins. So it seems like we're getting very close to finding in interstellar space examples that the same kinds of molecules that make up us are also developing elsewhere um, in the universe. And as a side note, this observation was made with uh, equipment that was actually built here at this uh, observatory. These band three receivers uh, are built to uh, identify a mission from molecules like cryopionamide um, at a certain wavelength. And uh, yeah, we built those here. So to, to, to end, I'd just like to say that uh, Hertzberg's legacy was also important to science in Canada. He was an extremely staunch advocate for science uh, as just a, a cultural activity that people needed to do in a civilized society. He served as chancellor of Carleton University for about 15 years. And this is one of his more prominent quotes. He thought that, and he said this to students, here in Canada, we should be able to spend a proportionate amount of money for the advance of knowledge without considering at every step what it is doing for the economy of the country. He felt that investing in science was in itself a virtuous thing to do and an important thing. And he, this was a message that he, he constantly uh, gave. And then he also was important, as I said, to training uh, generations of young scientists in Canada. And uh, as a result of that training, he also said, your aim should be to make Canada a country that is recognized throughout the world and throughout history as a country that has advanced uh, in a significant way the progress of science, art, and literature. And these are some of the people that he worked with. Was he correct? Well, it's telling to note that if you look at the list of people who have won the, the Nobel Prize in Canada, Gerhard Hertzberg was the fifth Canadian to win the Nobel Prize. And he was the fifth in 50 years by which the Nobel Foundation gave out prizes. Since that time, the numbers of Canadians that have won Nobel Prizes uh, is larger by a factor of four. So I think we're doing pretty well at, at, at having people in our, in our country who, um, who themselves are producing uh, the very best uh, science and medicine and literature and, and so forth uh, in the world. So hopefully I, through this talk, I've been able to give you a, a fair amount of interest in this person. Uh, if you are interested in more, again, please check out that Hertzberg 50 website. But if you'd like to go even deeper, I highly recommend this, uh, this biography of Gerhard Hertzberg by uh, Boris Stoichev, that's the man on the right, who um, was uh, one of the people in an earlier photograph who worked with Hertzberg in his lab. And again, as an example of the connections by which Hertzberg was able to influence people down the road, down the road in many, many ways of science. Uh, Boris Stoichev himself was actually my first year physics teacher at the University of Toronto. So this is an example. What one person does influences another and influences another all, all down through history. Thank you very much for your time. I would be happy to answer any questions you might might have. Go ahead.
Thank you. Yes. Yes. You you could actually use mo molecular spectroscopy to identify both biological and technological uh, activity on an explant. If you had a telescope that was large enough to be able to 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 see what is admittedly an extremely faint and difficult signal to detect. In terms of biological activity, people think that maybe you could find uh, uh, within uh, a spectrum uh, with, through reflected light, you could see the imprint of chlorophyll, for example, which would be indicative of plant life. And some have suggested that uh, you could even through spectra and reflected light see the kinds of things in the atmospheres that are indicative of technology, things like, well, smog, for example, uh, things that uh, uh, could only be produced uh, by um, intent, uh, and, uh, and so these kinds of signatures have actually been considered as, as ways of seeing that maybe that extraterrestrial life exists elsewhere. Go ahead, Kellen. Yeah, I've got a um, question from Janine. Um, so uh, the, uh, the chemistry is uh, fairly complex for those molecules, um, but how do their additional characteristics of vibrational and rotational add to the complexity of analyzing this spectra? Well, that's a really good question. So what I have been largely talking about is changes in the, how the electrons are arranged around molecules. I said that atoms have, uh, have a cloud of electrons around them. When you have a bunch of atoms together in a, in a molecule and they're sharing those electrons, it gets even more complicated. So the kinds of transitions that we see at optical wavelengths are largely those that from those electronic changes in energy, uh, the changes in electronic energy that create those, uh, those dips, those, those, um, uh, those uh, features that we see in optical spectra. Now, what Janine has said is that true, is that uh, unlike atoms, uh, molecules, because they are multi or three-dimensional objects, they can actually vibrate. Like the, molecule, the atoms in the molecule can bounce back and forth, or they can go like this, or what have you. And that actually is a whole other set of energy states that uh, a molecule is restricted in being. And there can be transitions between those. And those actually uh, uh, are of lower energy and are seen largely in the infrared. And then uh, there's actually another way that molecules can have discrete energy states. And that's when they rotate. They can rotate end over end. And those kinds of, for example, and those kinds of transitions occur at long wavelengths, like uh, the millimeter uh, size uh, wavelengths. And it's actually those rotational uh, energy states that makes made that carbon monoxide map that I showed of the whole galaxy um, earlier. It was only because uh, instrumentation was able to be able to see that kind of emission in the late 60s that we were able to see that such molecules existed in, in the cold and dark universe. So it gets a little complicated because sometimes you can have combinations of rotation and vibration at the same time. But Again, all of this stuff is is mapped out, and it can it can be complicated, but we're we're getting a good uh, handle on it. Any other questions? Well, thank you for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Have a good night, and enjoy your enjoy your visit. Okay. Well, thank you, Janine, for that great question. And as I said in the chat, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was our first question uh, online for, uh, to a speaker, and it came off seamlessly as well. Aside from the quality of the question, the the uh, uh, the, uh, the technical side worked very well. So th thanks for that. Uh, so I'm going to just jump into talking about what's up in the sky, and I have a little correction. To something I said last week as well. So this add some detail as we go along here. So sunset tonight was at 8.31 p.m. and civil twilight ends at 9.05 p.m. and nautical twilight ends at 9.49 uh, p.m. and astronomical twilight ends at 10.39 p.m. So uh, astronomical twilight 
um, begins at 3.59 a.m. and sunrise uh, is at 6.06 .06 a.m. tomorrow morning. And that means that there's now about five and a quarter hours of full darkness, moonlight and city lights uh, aside. So let's just talk about a little bit about illumination during the full moon and or around the full moon, which we started to talk a little bit about last week. Uh, so last week we talked about these definitions and mentioned that nautical twilight was when you could see at least some bright stars and also the horizon on the water. And I noticed near full moon a couple of nights ago, and full moon was yesterday, uh, that you could indeed see the brighter stars and that it was, but it was a little bit difficult to see some things on the ground, even in full moonlight. And so I would therefore say the conditions during full moon, during what should be a period of full darkness, it, uh, more closely approximate the conditions of the early parts of nautical twilight, uh, assuming a moonless sky, and rather than civil twilight. And civil twilight is when you can carry out activities uh, that, that are what you can do during the daylight typically, plus you can only see the bright planets. So, so therefore, when you have a full moon, it's a little bit like having nautical twilight all night long, and astronomers never reach those ideal conditions of full darkness. Uh, however, there's of course some little refinements to this. It does make a difference during full moon whether your eyes have adjusted to the darkness, so your perceptions of, of what you can see will be affected by that. So if you don't look like look at bright lights or at a phone uh, uh, or interior lights for 20 minutes, you should uh, your eyes should adjust. And so see if you can notice a difference when outside walking during moonlight. Doing that if to the darkness. So even uh, and even looking right at the full moon can diminish your night vision. So that's something that's worth noting. So the, uh, it's kind of interesting too that the intensity of moonlight also varies at different times of the year, and and that depend and it also depends on where you are on the Earth at any given time. So if you were farther south at this time of year and the moon was overhead, it would be less dimmed by having to pass through uh, as much air as it does here in Victoria. So down down where the moon is when it's highest in the sky, these nights it's passing through several times as much air as when the moon is uh, pretty much right overhead. So, it, so that means that if the moon's right overhead, it's gonna provide uh, more illumination. And so, uh, but there's also an issue in that the shadows on the ground are, are smaller, so it might be easier to trip in <laughs> semi-darkness as well. So during our walk, during the peak of the Perseids, my uh, wife and I didn't see any meteors, but and that was likely to the, the night sky being washed out by moonlight, uh, so we couldn't see the faint ones. But a few people did see some really bright ones, including someone who was up in the Qualicum area who saw one that uh, essentially flat in the sky near the Big Dipper. So I also want to correct something I said last week. I said that the brightness of the moon uh, quadruples between uh, first quarter when the moon and that's correct. So it goes up by a factor of 11 between first quarter and full moon, so even more. So uh, even though the amount of, of illuminated area only doubles. As noted before, this is actually due to several factors, including a lack of shadows on the surface uh, during the full moon, but also the property of the surface grains, which is discovered through the Apollo missions, uh, they tend to send light back along the path in which it came. And because at full moon, we're pretty much right in between the Earth and the Sun, the light is bouncing back from the lunar surface, uh, almost coming straight back to the Sun, and so the Moon looks quite a bit brighter. So it, uh, it actually doubles in brightness within a roughly 2.4 days of full Moon, and that means that the Moon is noticeably brighter for about five days each month. And unfortunately, this pretty much coincided with the peak of the meteor shower this year, and, but keep your eyes peeled over the next few nights as we get out of this exceptionally bright period for the moon and, uh, <clears throat> and as the moon moves on to the last quarter on th Thursday, August 18th. So, and you'll also notice that, star, uh, that uh, you'll be much better able to see the Milky Way after that point in the week as well. So what about the full moon to last quarter 
where we see the other half of the moon illuminated. So we said that uh, the for for first quarter, which is where you see the first uh, the uh, half of the moon illuminated, uh, to full moon it doubles by turns out from uh, last quarter to full moon it's actually a factor of twelve, so it's even more. So why is that? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change my sharing here and just show you hopefully a couple of images I, I copied and I apologize the uh, the, the uh, orientation is a little bit off but you should be able to see that this is the first quarter moon over on the left and what you notice is that, that there's more bright areas on the moon and relatively few lunar seas compared to the other side and so that's actually quite an interesting thing I, I've uh, long noted that and uh, I noticed that for example uh, the uh, the last quarter moon always looks a little bit more ghostly to me to my eyes and a little bit more mysterious and in the morning sky after the sun comes up you can still see the the last quarter moon but the contrast between it and the sky is actually less than say what the what the first quarter moon would be and so so, uh, so that's actually kind of uh, kind of a little interesting little factoid. So I encourage you to actually go out and have a look at that on the, on the next clear night. So let's go back to Stellarium here and just talk a little bit um, a little bit uh, more about what you can see in the nighttime sky. And the uh, just want to sh just talk a little bit about when the planets rise. So Saturn actually rose. Uh, right around the time that the sun went down tonight, so at 8.31 p.m., and it's actually visible in the southeast. So let's actually just advance the time just a little bit, and I'm just going to try to move this out of the way and hopefully move a few other things out of the way. This has got some meteor shower indicators and so on in the sky, which you don't really need to see right now. But there you can see Saturn in the southeast. and so uh, Jupiter rises at about 10.03 tonight. So if we just advance the time here a little bit, <clears throat> and I'm just going to 10.03 and just you can come back an hour, you can just see Jupiter peeking up over the horizon. So as the night gets darker, you'll start to see uh, Jupiter come up, say, towards 11. It'll start to be quite noticeable. And Mars actually comes up at about 11. 30 or 1151 so just before midnight and so we're going to see if we can find that as well and you won't see the planet uh, Uranus with your eyes probably <laughs> although it is possible but there you can see that Mars is coming up and here in Victoria it actually comes up a little bit further to the north so notice that that it's actually a little bit north of the easternmost part so I'd just like to, I think I'll end there tonight, but just to see if anybody has any questions. And uh, hopefully I didn't make any more little boo-boos in my talk tonight, but uh, we'll, we'll see if anybody wants to talk about anything. So unfortunately, Amy isn't here, our usual co-host. She's off doing some family stuff. And uh, and so we don't have, won't, probably won't be an interesting discussion without her, but and I don't think we have any student volunteers either tonight. So it's really uh, just us. So does anybody have any questions before we close down? Or, or thoughts about what I said? And yes, so as Calvin's noted, it's quite a quiet night. So I'm gonna leave it there. So thanks very much for attending, including the people on YouTube. And I hope you have a, a great night and uh, Jack Horkheimer used to say, uh, keep looking up. And I think that's something I'm going to start saying myself because we really need to keep doing that these days. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. John, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Jim.